Hello, my name is Martin Saunders. I'm the director of a new event for young people called Satellites. I'm also the uh, youth pastor at St. Mary's Rygate, which is uh, the church building uh, that I am currently sort of uh, recording this in. Uh, so hello to you uh, from there. Um, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about something that I have cared passionately about for the last 20 years of my life, which is youth ministry. Uh, and I wanna convince you that it is something that you, if you don't already feel like it's right at the very top of your priority list, need to feel passionately about too. Um, let me start with some painful realities. Uh, the future of the church in the UK is beginning to look bleak. In the context of a culture that no longer knows Jesus uh, as more than a swear word, our churches are failing to retain at least half of the young people growing up in their midst. Uh, and the ones who do remain are hanging on by a thread. Um, we are failing to make significant progress in evangelism and at the same time, uh, the most significant place of Christian conversion among young people in the UK, the Soul Survivor Festivals has just come to an end. And then we've seen the COVID-19 pandemic uh, really weaken and reduce our contact with young people uh, for more than a year. The implications for the gospel are very grave. Uh, the book of Judges uh, famously talks about a moment where a generation grew up who um, knew neither Lord, the Lord nor uh, what he had done uh, for Israel. And we're in danger of seeing a repeat of that in our lifetime on our watch. Uh, young people are being formed by a secularized world. They're being indoctrinated into a value system of sort of individualistic secular humanism, uh, where they're the center of their own world uh, and the answer to their own problems. And ultimately that value system will fail them. Uh, before I start to talk a bit more positively, um, let me just go a bit further. Churches are not currently equipped to do youth work effectively. The fact that more than half of young people leave the church during their teens, which is according to David Voas in 2013, is evidence that our current approach to youth discipleship is outdated and not working. Most churches now have few or no young people. The vast majority have no formal youth work, and many of those that do uh, lack people with the confidence or training to do it well. Another bit of research, Youthscape's 2016 research report, Losing Heart, which I um, really commend to you actually, uh, found that 75% of our churches don't do any youth work at all. And those that do feel a crushing lack of confidence about their effectiveness. And on top of this, as I said, the impact of the global pandemic in 2020 and now 2021 has meant that all Christian youth workers have had to severely reduce or even cease their activities. We've, we've just done a piece of research as yet unpublished uh, that suggests that across the board, we may have lost touch with as many as 50% of our young people. That is devastating. Uh, those teenagers with whom we didn't already enjoy a close connection, um, we may have been disconnected from permanently. So, serious intervention is imperative and now. But I do not believe that this is a lost cause. I do not believe that God has given up on this generation, nor do I believe that the Christian faith is somehow irrelevant in this culture and to our young people. We know, those of us gathered here, we know that the Christian faith offers young people uh, a far greater future than anything else. A sense of purpose and adventure, uh, which is greater than anything else that the world offers. And a real experience of the transformative love of God. But we also know that current ways of presenting and thinking about discipleship are not connecting with them. We need radical new approaches to help them see the plausibility and truth of the gospel. Um, we know too that they'll need help to navigate the value system of their secularized world. And so today, very briefly, I wanna suggest three journeys, uh, which I think the church needs to go on, which arguably all of us need to go on, if we are going 
to reverse the decline. And let me say, if you are not somebody who's particularly interested or convinced by young people, I think these are principles that translate beyond youth ministry, but please take seriously the call, the need to invest in our young people now. So the first journey I think we need to make is from maintenance mode to innovation mode. For years now, culture has been changing at an unbelievable pace, um, but the church has struggled to keep pace. So I think about an example from a technology in the sort of late 1980s when I was uh, just getting into my teens. Uh, you know, the technology you were playing with were like Nintendo Game Boys. Did you ever have a Nintendo Game Boy? Absolute bricks. Like, in terms of the technology, not very impressive at all, very clunky. Now, you know, in 2021, we have VR headsets, we have all the games you could possibly imagine, um, you know, downloadable in 4K, um, high definition uh, through, your, through the internet. You know, it is unthinkable the journey that we've made in terms of technology from the late 80s, early 90s, when youth ministry first really entered its current incarnation. Uh, to today. And yet if we look at the sort of preeminent model of youth ministry uh, in the 1990s versus the one today, it's still very similar. If you took a youth worker from, you know, 1990 uh, and plonked them into a youth group today, uh, the world outside would look very weird, but the world within the youth room would look very similar. So we haven't really moved on, and I believe that we have to change. Um, there's always been a sense uh, among us that we are doing the right things, but culture is getting harder to reach. Um, and and that, there may be some truth in that. There's also a sense among many of us that, you know, we're longing for COVID to come to an end so we can get things back to normal. But the truth is, I think we need radical innovation in terms of our methods. Now, I'm not going to present you with a nice list of ideas um, that you can just tick off Rather, I think that in a rapidly changing culture, uh, we need to embrace our own culture of innovation within every church and within the church as a whole. For the last seven or eight years, uh, the team I've been leading at Youthscape has been focusing uh, on exactly this. We developed a five-stage innovation process, uh, rather like the ones used by Apple and other tech giants, um, to uh, develop ideas, programs, the things that we, the new things that we are bringing to youth ministry. If you want to know more about that, by the way, please feel free to contact me at Youthscape. I'd love to bore on uh, forever about that with you. But let me just rush through the basics now. Um, if you want to find new ways of reaching the young people in your communities, I think you need to start with a blank sheet of paper and then work your way through this five-step process. So the first uh, stage of our innovation process is, we call it opportunities, but really it's about listening to the needs, the issues, the story of the young people in your community. Listen to God, listen to what's really going on on the ground. What, who are the young people that you seek to serve? And what is it that they really need? What are they interested in? What do they lack? Listening is a much better place to start than the second stage of our innovation process, which is ideas. So don't start with the idea, start before the idea and, um, and really try to think about what are the needs and the opportunities. So then in the ideas phase, spend some time really thinking uh, about all of the ideas that could respond to those needs that you've seen. And then after you've really spent time investing in developing ideas, really got people around a table to, to properly think and come up with every idea and every angle you possibly can. Then you're ready to develop your idea. Now this is the stage that I think we frequently skip in kind of youth ministry innovation and in all church innovation, truthfully. But it's really important. It's the difference between good and great. It's really making an idea work. It's taking a lens to it and saying, or a series of lenses to an idea and saying, you know, does this really work? Is it the best that it can be? So really working an idea, developing an idea, spending time on that. And then fourthly, piloting, testing your ideas, um, you know, building a prototype if that's appropriate, or running a short version of something to see if it really works, getting feedback, learning from that feedback. And then the final stage of our innovation process, we call evaluation, and it is about um, learning from how well this thing really worked in practice. Did it really meet the aims that we set in the first place? And then can we innovate even further as a result? Could something new spring out of each innovation that we launch? So that's very simply the, um, the Youthscape innovation process, but the world of young people like keeps on changing. It keeps on changing like faster than I can keep up. I've got two teenagers of my own. I, I struggle to keep up even with my own kids, let alone those that I serve in, in my youth ministry here in Reigate. 
Um, even the ways that they communicate with each other and the ways that they understand stories keep changing, keep switching format. So we need to keep moving too. So that's the first journey that I think we need to make from maintenance mode, doing things the way we always have to truly a mode of innovation. The second shift, the second journey is from talking about faith to living faith. Now this is really, I'm aiming at the youth leaders among us, but I will be surprised if this doesn't ring true for many other leaders too. If you're anything like me, you probably carry around a little bit of shame about this. We, of course, we love God, don't we? Of course we do. Otherwise, why on earth would we be doing what we do? But with the many pressures of Christian leadership, the temptation to scrimp on our own relationship with God, I mean, I mean like properly investing time every day in our devotional life and our relationship with God is a very great pressure. Um, I've been involved in youth ministry for um, 20 years now, so I feel like I've earned the right to say things like this, but I have lost count of the gifted leaders who I've talked to kind of off the record, who I've met and, the, and they've confessed that when the door closes and they're no longer in the public eye, um, you know, they, they don't truly invest time in their own relationship with God. Now, perhaps it's quite hard, if we're honest, to switch from a position of power, responsibility and authority and leadership to a posture of submission, which we take as a disciple and uh, in our own relationship with God. Um, whatever the reason, leaders often don't have the kind of devotional life to which we call others. And I will put my hand up and say that in my years of youth ministry, sometimes that has been true of me too. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, follow me as I follow Christ. But how can we possibly expect our young people or anyone else uh, to follow our example if it isn't authentic? So we have to press ourselves back into spiritual practices for our own benefit and for the benefit of those that we seek uh, to lead. Actually, uh, I've found lockdown to be a bit of a revelation to me in terms of this. The first, the first lockdown back in March 2020, I tried to fill my life with um, so much stuff, so much kind of, I, I guess I probably had something you'd call a messiah complex, uh, if that's not too, um, put, put too fine a point on it. Um, you know, I, I was trying to save the young people in my community. I was trying to save all the projects that suddenly were under threat. Uh, and I was trying to fill up the busyness of my life again. And, uh, and actually, God didn't get much of a look in in that first, that first lockdown. Like, I didn't throw myself into God. Now, I think probably over time, I've learned the lessons of that. And about six months ago, I started doing something that has it re required an enormous investment of my, of my time but I spend an hour every day now in, in silence and prayer and reading and journaling the Bible and doing that every single day without fail. And I only say that because for me at least, that's quite an achievement to do that for six months. Uh, to do that every day without fail has been transformational and I know how much better equipped I am to lead other people. So I encourage you, if that's not the story for you, you know, even if it's something you can't do publicly, Commit again to yourself, recommit to taking that journey every day with God. And if youth ministers don't do this, how on earth can they hope to pass that on to the next generation? And here, really, finally, quickly, is the most important one. I put it last because I want you to remember it. We need to make a journey from God as a lifestyle choice to God at the centre of life. So this is about how we talk to young people about God. If I was to caricature uh, youth discipleship in the last 20 years, which is again, you know, the time I've been doing youth ministry, it would be like this. God is a lifestyle choice. We invite young people to come to church on a Thursday night, uh, but it's okay, they've got music practice on a Wednesday night, a party on a Friday, going out with their friends to the park on a Saturday. And it's like all those things are on a level. All those things are just lifestyle choices. God is no greater or less than any of those. And I think this version of discipleship, where we've just got young people hanging on, when we're just saying, please just give us an hour a week, that produces what the American researchers Smith and Denton call moralistic therapeutic deism. It's kind of God as Santa Claus. That's how they experience God. So what do we need instead of that? What is, what is a better way? Because that version of things is clearly losing young people in droves. I honestly believe that the shift we need to make if we want to see a generation of young people uh, engage with the Christian faith is to um, invite them to put God at the very centre of their lives. God above all of those things. 
life in all its fullness because God comes first and then makes sense of all the other parts of their life. God's not a lifestyle choice, but he wants to be in every element of young people's lives and their lifestyle choices. And they will experience the fullness of life and him and the greatest adventure they could ever be part of if they put him first and recognize his place in everything else. Um, that is the, um, the concept at the heart of Satellites, which is the festival that we're launching uh, at Youthscape, where young people get the chance to hear about God for the first time, but also how to do that, how to work out what it looks like to put God at the center of their lives. I genuinely believe that is the change that we need to see, um, because it's not that young people are leaving the Christian faith because we've made it too difficult for them. It's because they look at it and we've made it too easy. It's not the adventure that it was meant to be, and that needs to change. The situation we face in youth ministry right now is grave. It's not, it's not on a par with all the other problems facing the, the church, and of course I would say this. It's much bigger than most of them. We can fiddle around with the taps and the pipes in the house, right? But right now there is a crack in the main pipe coming in from the street, and it's only getting bigger. Things have to change. Youth ministry must be prioritized by our churches, but it has to be innovative and responsive to young people's culture. It must be authentic and led by leaders who truly love young people, but love Jesus too. And it has to call young people to the adventure of putting God at the very heart of our lives, rather than seeing him as a simple lifestyle choice among many. Because we are satellites and our lives make sense when we live them in orbit around him instead of expecting everything to revolve around us. And this is the simple message I see right at the heart of scripture. And it's one that can transform a generation.